Hello everyone, welcome, thanks for coming. I'm Srishti, I'm a developer advocate at the Wikimedia Foundation. I have been working with this organization since past two and a half years, and most of my work is around supporting new developers. So in this talk today, I will be sharing with you some of the opportunities we have for new contributors in the Wikipedia community and also some of the efforts that we have been doing in the organization to bring new contributors. So this is the agenda of my talk. I will start with Wikimedia ecosystem first, and then also highlight a little bit about our technical community, then share with you some technical areas and projects we have, and then towards the end, touch upon some of our ongoing efforts to onboard new developers. And before I dive into Wikimedia ecosystem, I want to confuse you here for a few seconds. Can I get a show of hands for folks who are maybe familiar with three or more than three logos that are on this slide? Wow, a lot of folks. That's exciting. Um, so. These logos, they are different, but in a way connected. Wikipedia, for sure, needs no introduction. Then MediaWiki, it is the software that powers Wikipedia and its sister projects. And then uh, Wikimedia Foundation, it is this nonprofit, which is based out of San Francisco, and it supports, promotes, and owns Wikipedia and its sister projects. And so Wiki, it's this concept, as some of you know, of quick collaborative editing online. And some of the wikis that you might have seen or heard, it stems from this concept. So then what is Wikimedia movement? It is everything. It encompasses all projects, support structures, and thousands and thousands of volunteers who make this work possible. And all of them, they are working towards the single vision, which is to imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. So when I first joined the Wikimedia Foundation, one of my colleagues said that it will probably take me about six months to get a knack of it. And now when I look back, I feel he was really right. <laughs> because there are these different pieces and it's kind of hard to get a sense of how they are connected. So one of the volunteer contributors, they have uh, made this visual representation to show how different pieces in the Wikimedia movement are connected. So if you look at it, you'll see that the Wikimedia Foundation, it's uh, really at the epicenter of it. And then it owns Wikipedia and some other free knowledge projects that we have. And Wikimedia also recognizes and supports other affiliate organizations like chapters and user groups and thematic organizations that are doing work in their local communities or among their interest groups to support the work of Wikimedia. And volunteers, uh, they are really the key because they are not only contributing to these projects, but also supporting the work of the organizations. And then we have Wikimedia trademarks then, that anybody can use if they are interested in spreading the work of Wikimedia, but to do so, they need to seek permissions from the Wikimedia Foundation. But we are not WikiLeaks. We don't have anything to do with them. It's not even a wiki. Uh, and then, uh, there are other wikis, so there are over like 30,000 wikis that are maybe powered on MediaWiki, but we are not directly involved with them. So although there is a lot going on on the editor engagement side of things at Wikimedia, in this talk I will be focusing mostly on our technical community and making technical contributions to Wikipedia. So who actually makes contributions to Wikipedia? We have a lot of people from Europe, Asia, and North America who contribute. From Asia, more specifically from India, where I come from, a lot of people contribute. 
but we see very less activity from Africa, South America, and Oceania. And I personally find these statistics very similar to what has come up in the Stack Overflow survey as well in the recent years. And this is a bit of uh, an overview of our technical contributions. In 2017 and 18, we, uh, we saw 413 distinct contributors who made a little over 45,000 commits in over 1,000 repositories. And out of these 413 contributors, 60% were volunteers who contributed 18% of the overall commits. And this is a bit of uh, statistics around our new developers. So on an average, we attract somewhere between 40 to 60 developers in every quarter. And the, this trend, it's very similar to what we have been seeing in the past few years. So on an average, 40 to 60 developers. But I will not talk about retention. Let's just talk about the good things. Um, you can talk to me after the talk, maybe, and we can, we can share more. So what makes Wikimedia volunteers contribute? So like in any free and open source software project, people have different motivations. Similar to that, in Wikimedia as well, people who contribute, they share different motivations. Some come because they believe in our vision. Some they have, uh, some grew up reading Wikipedia, and now they want to give back. Some want to help the editor community. Lots of different motivations. And um, there are a lot of interesting stories as well of volunteers. And uh, I want to share with you one story. So recently, I was chatting with my coworker, and I asked him that, hey, like, why your name is in all our API docs? And he laughed and said, well, I was 17 then, and our docs have not been updated ever since. <laughs> He's sitting right there, Rowan, and uh, he, it's been 12 years now that he's still with Wikimedia and uh, now leading a team at, at the foundation. So lots and lots of interesting stories to share. Some people, they stay for a short time, some never leave and find their home in our community. So when I joined the foundation, um, I had this question, like my friends have also, that. Uh, what is remaining in Wikipedia to be developed? Like, who are you, like, for what reason you need volunteers? Wikipedia is out there, it's done, so what else? And only when I joined, I learned that it's a complex world out there. There is too much going on. Um, if you look at Wikipedia, right, what it was in 2000s and what it is now, it has evolved a lot. And then there are so many other sister projects that have grown in all these years as well. And now we are in 2019, when we, are, we have started to think about the future, that in a decade from now, there are so many billion people who are come, going to come online. So how do we prepare ourselves now to serve them better in the future? So for lots and lots of different things, Wikipedia needs help. So this was a bit of an overview of Wikimedia ecosystem and a little bit about our technical community. And now I would like to share with you some technical areas and projects that we have for new contributors. So like in any free and open source software project, there are four steps. You first pick a task related to a Wikimedia project or technical area you then set up the development environment, and when you're done, you choose and solve a task, and finally, you submit your code changes. So to start with, I will uh, talk a bit about step one, and I personally feel it's a complicated step because there are way too many options to choose from. So this is a very kind of high-level overview of our projects, our main projects. Wikipedia, everybody here knows. Then we have other projects which are very popular, 
but uh, you, you might have actually heard them, but you don't know that they're also associated with Wikimedia. For example, we have Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons. How many of you know those projects? Um, cool. So Wikidata, it's the central repository of data that is being used on all Wikimedia sites. And then Wikimedia Commons, it is this repository of free use images, media files, audio files, etc. So these are very popular projects. But then there are lots and lots of other projects in which there is not much development going on, but these projects are popular in their own communities. For example, we have Wiki Voyage, which is a travel guide, which a lot of travelers edit. Then we have Wikiversity, which is a collection of resources for learners and educators that a lot of educators use. Then Wiktionary, which is a free content dictionary, and Wikisource, which is a digital library for textual sources, and so many other projects like that. Then we have a lot of technical areas that relate to some of the main projects that I shared with you and also some of the other projects that we have. So if you look at it, the similar areas, they're kind of clubbed together. And an example of that is MediaWiki Core, which is up there. So everything MediaWiki is kind of together. And then there are other areas which span across different areas. For example, templates and gadgets that you see on the right, they can be written on Wiki. So they are spanning across all things MediaWiki in this diagram. But don't feel overwhelmed. I'm not going to talk about everything which is on this slide and only share with you some newcomer-friendly areas and a project that relates to that area. So to begin with, we have a, the first one is MediaWiki extensions. So the MediaWiki software it, itself, it comes with default functionality. But then if you want to enhance the capability of software, you can write extensions. And this is the most newcomer friendly area. You can either contribute to an existing extension or develop a new extension. I think currently there are over 1,900 extensions that are registered on MediaWiki.org. And this example is of an extension called Revision Slider which lets you to browse history interactively. So if you go to a Wikipedia article today and go to an article's history page, you'll be able to compare revisions and see this extension in action. We don't have many desktop apps, uh, but maybe I will share with you two popular ones. So there is this app called Huggle, which is essentially a div browser that lets you to <clears throat> go through the edits very quickly and reward the ones that are problematic. And of course, to use a tool like this, you need some extra permissions. Then there is another app that we have. It's called Kiwix, which is an offline reader for Wikipedia. And it supports an open source file format called Zim. And this example, uh, the screenshot that you see uh, is of Kiwix running Wikipedia on a one laptop per child machine. We also have a few mobile apps for our popular projects. We have a Wikipedia app for Android and iOS and staff at the Wikimedia Foundation solely contributes to that app. Then there is another one, uh, which is for Wikimedia Commons that I shared with you earlier. This project, it's purely run and maintained by our community members and very newcomer friendly. Then a lot of our volunteer contributors, they develop bots and tools to help editors and other volunteers do their work effectively. There are around 1,000 bots that operate on Wikipedia and help uh, with repetitive tasks. 
But in order to get your bot approved, there are, of course, some steps that you need to follow, and it needs to go through some special permissions. And an example of that bot is uh, a citation bot that help format and expand citations on Wikipedia articles. Then we also have tools that are independent and standalone. And an example of that is this tool called Programs and Events Dashboard that a lot of uh, educators who run courses and edit-a-thons around Wikipedia use while they're actually running courses and edit-a-thons. And for both of these, we have a dedicated cloud services infrastructure that allows you to host, operate, and maintain your tools and bots. Very cool. Um, we have a dedicated team of staff and uh, volunteers who help run our cloud services. Now, this is a very fancy schmancy area, I would say. A lot of researchers and analysts, they use Wikipedia APIs along with the data which is available that comes from Wikimedia sites to make cool visualizations and um, help, take, help make data informed decisions. So this graphic that you see is generated using the same process. And if you go to this resource, seealso.org, you will be able to see a lot of different cool visualizations like this generated using the same process. Then we are fairly new in the machine learning space, but we have a lot of cool activities going on. I would like to share with you one of our popular projects in this space. It's called the ORIS project. It's an acronym for Objective Revision Evaluation Service. It's essentially a web service and API that evaluates, help evaluate whether an edit made to a Wikipedia article is a good quality edit or a bad quality edit. So this edit quality flow that you see on the slide tells you that edits, when first made to Wikipedia, they are kind of unknown, but when they go to, through the ORIS filter, you start learning a bit more about their patterns. And you can imagine that a service like this, already a lot of uh, projects, they are using it to help editors do their work in a more efficient manner. And there are different components of this project that uh, one can contribute to. Then uh, we have something called gadgets. Now gadgets, they're very similar to extensions that I first shared with you. The only difference is that gadgets, they are a bit less complicated than, uh, than extensions. The code for them lives on mediawiki.org. And uh, with gadgets, you support very less functionalities. And you can inject a JavaScript from client side on mediawiki.org to make a gadget in action. And it starts first from a user script. So if you want to enhance the functionality of MediaWiki software, you can write a user script that will give you a customized experience. But then when a site administrator thinks that something that you have written might be beneficial for the rest of the community, then they consider promoting it as a gadget and making it available to all users so that they can enable it from their preferences. I think that in this space, uh, we are not maybe organized well to receive contributions on existing gadgets because the functionality itself for these gadgets are very small, but you can write your own gadgets. So these were all the kind of technical areas with projects. But besides these, there are other major areas as well where one can contribute. So uh, you can either help apply Wikimedia design principles to other projects which have not received, received uh, that kind of guidelines yet. And then there are tons and tons of documentation projects that need improvement. Then if you are familiar with a language other than English, then you can help translate technical docs on mediawiki.org and other projects. 
And uh, lastly, you can help report bugs for our software projects or help do testing and write test cases, etc. So these were all the projects and technical areas that we have. And once you have decided which one you want to contribute to, the next step from there on is to set up the development environment. But for every project, the process would be different. And I'm not gonna go into the details and uh, let's not get into the ID wars here. <laughs> um, so after that, the process would be to choose and solve a task. We use this task management software called Fabricator at Wikimedia. Have you heard of that tool? Anybody? No? Um, so uh, the most recommended way to start is to pick a good first bug. Uh, and you can see that uh, associated with the project tag, if it's a good first bug, pick some bugs, and then task assignment in Fabricator, it works very similar to what you might have seen in other free and open source projects as well, that if you're interested in working on a task, you go and comment on it and say, I'm interested, and if you have any specific questions, you ask, and then you claim a task and start working on it, and this would make sure that nobody else works on it while you're working on it. And so after that, when you have some changes to upload, then that gets uploaded to this tool called Garrett that we use for code review. So you upload a patch, it goes to Garrett, and then somebody from our community, an experienced developer, they give you code review feedback and also help you merge your changes. So these were kind of all the steps that I shared with you. But I also want to highlight some of the venues, dedicated venues that we have for new developers. And the advantage here is that you get to work with a mentor um, while you're working on a project. And so we participate in uh, quite a few outreach programs and events. We have Google Summer of Code and Outreachy and Google Coding, which helps us bring students, uh, non-students, high school students from all over the world. Then we also have international hackathons uh, that we organize twice a year. And uh, we also give sponsorship to our active contributors and also new developers to be able to attend these events and get to work with the community. So these were all the steps that, as a new developer, you take to contribute to Wikimedia projects. But as uh, developer advocates and program managers, we have also been taking some steps to bring new contributors. And uh, in this process, we have learned a lot. There are some, th some things that don't work well. There are things that work well. And so I will be sharing with you all of that now. So this is an annual program, Onboarding New Developers, that we piloted in 2017 with a goal to bring new wave of developers to Wikimedia projects in the hope that this would change our current stagnant trends. We used uh, this program evaluation framework to lay our goals, outcomes, and activities. And obviously, long-term goal was to have better software for Wikimedia. Some of the short-term outcomes were to have bigger outreach and easy onboarding and higher retention. And some of the activities we did were around researching new groups and programs and participating in external developer events, providing support channels, et cetera. And this program, it was uh, led by a three-person team at Wikimedia, and some of the activities we did as part of this was a community effort. So I will share with you some of the activities we did, and then towards the end, talk about pro uh, program outcomes and lessons learned. So the first acti activity we did was developing this new developer's guide. 
It lives on MediaWiki.org. It has a list of newcomer-friendly projects with very clear instructions on how to get started. So it has things like what are skills required, or who the mentors are, or what are the recommended tasks to work on, etc. We also conducted quarterly surveys with the goal to understand experiences and frustrations of new developers as they contribute to our projects. We documented the results that came out of these surveys along with some of the other new developers, metrics and trends and activities happening elsewhere in the Wikimedia movement in quarterly reports also on MediaWiki.org. Then one of the Wikimedia chapters, it's in Austria, they developed a hackathon mentoring program which we have used in more than four events already. And the key component of this program was a mentor and mentee ceremony, where the goal is to make sure that everybody finds a project towards the end of the ceremony and they are able to work with help from a mentor on a particular project. We also published our guide, which is also on MediaWiki.org. Then this is about university students and professors reaching out to us who are interested in teaching free and open source software through Wikimedia projects. And oftentimes we don't know how to help them. Of course, we can provide a list of projects to work on, but more than that, how do we help them assess students' work? Those are the kind of requests we have received. We don't know how to navigate. So last year at LibrePlanet, I attended Matt Bernier's session who talked about these two cool initiatives, Mozilla's OSSN and Teaching Open Source Posse. And uh, they also connected me with the folks who are behind these initiatives after the event. And we ended up collaborating with them. So as a first step, kind of listed Wikimedia in the repository of projects and hoping to learn more from them going forward. Few of our active members from Africa, they formed a developers group with a goal to increase participation from African continent. And with very little resources and guidance from us, they have conducted developer events in a lot of different places in Africa, Ghana, Cameroon, and Cote d'Ivoire. And we are very excited and supportive of this initiative because we don't see quite a lot of activity happening in Wikimedia projects and developers coming from that region. So this is really, uh, this really makes us happy. We also expand, uh, experimented a little bit to improve our code review workflow process for new developers. So we developed this newcomer bot for Gerrit, the code review tool that we use, which does two things. So every time a new developer submits a patch, it adds a welcome message in a comment to their patch and also adds them to a newcomer group in Gerrit, which helps us to keep track of their patches afterwards. And then in a weekly email to on our mailing lists, we try to highlight these newcomer patches and then encourage members from our community to review them. I'm not sure if you have seen that chat system XKCD, but we often bring that up at work when we find ourselves entangled in a discussion around too many communication platforms. We have a lot of IRC lovers at Wikimedia as well, and um, it's very hard to kind of try new platforms, but we want to make sure that we continue to experimenting with new tools out there and um, new tools that can help us serve different audiences and different use cases and specifically engage new developers. So as an example, we piloted Discourse as a developer support channel. It's still ongoing. Then we have uh, Zulip for our outreach programs 
And we have uh, started to also use Telegram for our international events uh, hack at hackathons to connect participants but haven't found a single solution yet that works for everything. So these were all the activities that we did. And uh, in this process, we learned a lot. There were things that worked well, but there were things that did not work so well. So as an outcomes, I would say uh, for things that worked well, the mentoring program that I shared with you earlier that was developed by Wikimedia Austria, which is a Wikimedia chapter, it won the Austrian Open Source Award. So it was, a reward, it was really rewarding for us. And a few other things that, are, that we have started to notice, I will talk about that. So we have started to see increased participation of developers from Africa in our outreach programs, something that we were not able to see earlier. And this is, it's likely due to the increased outreach happening in the region that we have started to see more developers coming in now. Also something again very interesting. So usually in our stat, it comes up that we have very less female and non-binary folks participating in Wikimedia projects. But in the time of the year when we coordinated Wikimedia's participation in outreach programs like Outreachy, uh, I'm not sure if you know about it, but if, if you don't know, then I would encourage you to check it out. So program like Outreachy, which is designed to bring folks from groups that are underrepresented in tech, we saw a, a sudden increase of female and non-binary folks joining our projects. And so it was a very strong indication for us that we need to continue to put more resources into coordinating programs like these. And for us as, uh, as program managers or developer advocates, I think this program helped us to organize ourselves better to bring new developers systematically in our technical spaces. So these were all the positive things. Let's come to the negative things. Surprisingly, the needle did not move. Our stats around onboarding and retaining new developers, it remained the same. There wasn't any change. In our survey results, it came up again and again that new developers are struggling to understand technical documentation and also frustrated with the code review process. And I think what happened there was that we hit the chicken and egg problem. With all this engagement work, we were focusing mostly on the surface level, but not going deeper into the contributor pipeline and seeing how new developers are doing there. But with a three-person team, it's really hard to balance that problem. And we are also, uh, in, in our team, we had other things to do. This was just the program that we were running on the side. But I think that there are still some important kind of learnings and possible future directions that uh, we are thinking that we can ta take going forward. And so one is that we work with our project teams, both in Wikimedia, both like the staff members at Wikimedia and also in our community and continue to make improvements to our contribution guidelines and processes and technical documentation. And then another could be that we work towards building capacity in local developer communities who can then help us scale some of, some of these efforts and work we are doing. So this, this was all kind of our learnings and I would uh, be curious to know, maybe after the talk, if any of you here have experimented with similar models in your project or organizations around bringing new contributors and that have worked well for you. 
I would be uh, I would be really curious to know more. So thank you for listening. That was it. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, and second, I was just wondering if you could, uh, if you had any more details on like uh, what kind of technologies you use for your machine learning applications. Sure. Uh, so I think for everything that is media wiki, we uh, we have the LAMP stack, and for that you would need to be familiar with PHP and JavaScript. But then we have lots and lots of other different projects, for example, machine learning, all the different components of that project, they are written in Python and also related libraries we use. Yeah. Mostly PHP and Python, I would say. Yeah. I was wondering, is as part of this, trying to make it easier for like, newcomers, did you spend any effort into curating specific tasks that are more appropriate for people coming in instead of just directing to it? Here's an interesting project. Did you try to find some things that didn't require much domain knowledge or would be good things to get started with that could be finished quickly? Yeah, that's a good question. So the new developer's guide that I shared in my talk earlier, so that was kind of one effort in this process that we wanted to come up with a list of newcomer friendly projects and then direct newcomers to there to start with. But uh, under those projects, when it comes to tasks, so we used to have this easy tag in our uh, fabricator where newcomers could go, go to and maybe start from there, but that easy itself was very confusing. Easy can mean different things. And I think for quite a lot of time, we had this discussion in our community that what the good name should be. And you know, like when you have so many people in, our communi in a community, then people have different opinions. And it, take a, it took us a while to change the name from easy to good first bug. So we have that now, but I think uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to get our good first bugs in shape and make sure that they have clear instructions and it's easy for newcomers to follow. Uh, do you guys focus on language agnostic information? Uh, it seems like Wikipedia probably has a lot of information in English. I was wondering if Translation is probably a huge uh, effort of donators or volunteers and how like storing information agnostically or uh, abstractly and not in a certain language might help uh, with translation and for everyone to access. Um, I'm not sure I followed your question right, but maybe after the talk I can connect you with Rowan and he will okay. be able to help. As someone who just would want to get started, but is not a, I'm not a coder per se, I'm more of a configuration, drag and drop kind of application developer. Is there tools you use or opportunities to volunteer in that sort of way? System configuration, not necessarily coding? Um, yes, I'm sure that, that we have opportunities in this space as well. And maybe after the talk, I can point you to some links that you could look into, yeah. Hey, 
Hi, I'm just curious how many, uh, or what do you think the distribution of new developers who come um, starting as Wikipedia editors and then becoming uh, involved in the developing communities versus just being outside of the Wikimedia community and then coming in? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So as I was mentioning in my talk earlier that people come with different motivations and Yes, there are a lot of people who, you know, uh, have uh, who who grew up reading Wikipedia and have edited Wikipedia articles, but now they are at a point that they realize they should be building tools to help editors. So a lot of people we see converting from editors to developers, but I don't have uh, statistics on that. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think that we have actually tried to uh, like figure out how many of those editors are converting into developers, but yes, that's, that's the pattern we see a lot. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, that was great. Yes.